Well, Merry Christmas and welcome to the online ministry for Inverell Anglican Church. My name is Matt and it's great that you're joining us today, this Christmas day of 2022, as we celebrate our God, the Lord, come into our world for us as a baby, not only as a baby, but as a saviour, our saviour. Uh, in Luke's gospel in chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, it says this, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David, a saviour, who is Christ the Lord. Well, he is Christ the Lord indeed. And as we begin our time, we now begin with a song of celebration, our first carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. Ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come, ye, O come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore He in Christ the Lord. God of God, lights of light eternal, There is something about Christmas that lasts, even when the food, tinsel and toys have all gone. Have you ever wondered what's so special about the first Christmas that we still celebrate it 2,000 years later? Meet Jesus. 
Jesus was born in a small Israeli village. His parents were ordinary people. Jesus' first bed was an animal's feeding box because they were far from home. The first people to hear the good news were shepherds, camped out under the stars. Everything about the birth of Jesus was simple and humble, except for the incredible birth announcement by angels. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Why is this baby such joyful good news for all people? Jesus' birth is part of God's bigger story of hope and healing for our world. This extraordinary baby would change the world forever. He would become the Saviour that would rescue all of humanity. His life, death and resurrection would pay the price for all of our mistakes and failures. Now, because of Jesus, we can be friends with God today and have hope for tomorrow. If you're looking for the joy that lasts this Christmas, meet Jesus. He is good news of great joy for all people. Well, as we come to hear from God's word, let me pray. A loving Father, Heavenly God, who sent your only Son into the world that we might have life through faith in him, we pray that you would grant to us who celebrate his birth this day, that we might come at last into the fullness of life in your heavenly kingdom where he now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Well, our Bible readings today begin in the Old Testament uh, with Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 11. Uh, then our psalm for today is Psalm 98. And finally, our New Testament reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 19 through to 34. That's John chapter 1, 19 through to 34. Pause for a moment now. Have a read of those passages with whoever you're watching with today. And then uh, we'll resume and I'll share with us from those. Well, as we think about God's word now, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that this Christmas day, as we open up the words of your Bible, that you would reveal yourself more clearly to us, that we would see your love uh, on display here, that we would give our lives to Jesus and leave here worshipping you. Amen. Well, Christmas is a stressful time. It can be, can't it? And there's so many parties to go to, there's so many presents to buy and to wrap, there's salad to make, there's, there's family that we need to host and have in our, in our homes. And I wonder for you, who feels the pressure most at Christmas time? For me, growing up, that was usually my mum, especially when it came to getting us kids out the door to go somewhere. And so that meant that something we often heard around Christmas time was, hurry up, we're going to be late. We're going to be late. And now, no one wants to be late. Perhaps you're sitting here watching, even on Christmas morning, saying, well, this better be quick because I'm going to be late to, to my family lunch. We don't want to miss the start of lunch. We don't want to miss the start of presents being opened, or the first glass of wine, or the first ball of backyard cricket. We don't want to be late to the party. But in our Bible passage this morning, we may feel exactly that way, like, like we're turning up late to the party. Right, we're in the first chapter of John's biographical account of Jesus' life. And John the writer has just given his introduction. And so we expect now to see the nativity scene play out on the page in front of us. But as we look at it, we don't see it. In an introduction to Jesus' life, we would expect to see the shepherds, the angels, the baby born in the manger and all the, all the rest of it. So where's the birth of Jesus? It feels like we've missed it. It's not here. We might feel like we've turned up late to the party, like we've just missed the beginning. Where's this, this good news of great joy that we're meant to be celebrating at Christmas? Well, it's coming. But John, the gospel writer here, he doesn't want us to simply have, a, have this picture of little baby Jesus in our minds, all meek and mild and miss the real significance of who he is and why he came into the world. 
the writer John here, he wants you to know exactly who Jesus is and why he's coming at Christmas was so significant. And so I wonder then, do you know why it was so significant? How would you answer that question? Well, as the author gets into the story of Jesus, he introduces us not to Jesus yet, but to another man, to a guy named John. And it's a different John to the author. It's John the Baptist. And you can picture him in your mind. He's a, he's a kind of odd man. He's hairy. He wears camel leather. He eats bugs. And looking at him, right, he's the kind of guy that you hope your daughter or your granddaughter doesn't bring along to family Christmas lunch. He looks a bit odd. And what he was doing was odd as well, because as we read, we see that he was taking people out into the wilderness, into the river, dugging them in the water and saying that he was preparing them to encounter God. And now the religious people back in the city in Jerusalem heard about this and they had to, they wanted to know what was going on. So they sent people to sort him out. They're not sure if they want him at their Christmas lunch either. And so they ask him in verse 21 and 22, they say, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet of God that we have been waiting for? And now at this point, we're going to pause because hearing this, you may say, what in the world is going on? Who, who are they talking about here? You might say, this feels a bit foreign to Christmas. It feels like we're late to the party. Not just like we're late to the party, but that we've landed in a completely different story. And that's exactly what's going on. In fact, even if we were reading about the angels, the shepherds and baby Jesus, we would still be landing in the middle of another story. And in one way, I mean, this shouldn't be surprising. If you were to open up your Bible, where do we find Jesus? It's not until about three quarters of the way through at least. And so that's the first point I want you to see here. This may feel unfamiliar, Because Christmas lands in the middle of a much bigger story. It's God's story. The story of the God of the universe making a way for people to come back into him and find relationship. It's a story that started in the garden with the first man and woman deciding that they knew better than creator God. It's a pattern that we are caught up in. It's a problem that begins in our heart. We think we know best. And the Bible calls that sin. And just like Adam and Eve, our sin alienates us from God as well. And no matter matter how hard we try, we can't fix that brokenness. We can't fix our broken relationship with God. But the story doesn't end there. It's also the story of God saying to people thousands of years ago, one day I will turn up and make things right. And so as we're dropped into the middle of this story, we meet John the Baptist. It's a, and the religious people are saying, who are you? What are you doing? Are you the one that we're waiting for? And John replies in verse 23 by echoing the words of one of the most famous Old Testament prophets. He says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. He's saying that God is going to come. Get the bulldozer out. Clear way for him, right? God is going to come and fix the brokenness in our world. He's going to come and fix our brokenness. And so get ready to receive him into your life. That's what John is saying. It's a big call to prepare yourselves to live for God. And I wonder with that call, is that the way that you've come here today to to watch this today? Have you prepared your life? Are you ready to receive God into your heart? Now, I lived in Sydney for a number of years, and there's some things you see in the city that you don't see in other places. And one of those things is professional sign spinners. And now you may have seen videos of them online elsewhere. Basically, they are are guys who stand on the street corner with a big arrow, a big bit of cardboard pointing to something. And they're spinning it. They do all sorts of fancy tricks and spins and flips, and it's really visually striking. However, their whole goal like John the Baptist, is to point to something other than themselves. Their goal is to get you to to look at them, to grab your attention, but then point you somewhere else. And that's what John the Baptist is doing here. He's saying, I'm not the messenger. I'm not the one that you're waiting for, but look, here he comes. 
And indeed, as we get to verse 29, here he is. He's the hero of Christmas that we're waiting for. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now you might think that's a rather odd description of Jesus. A Lamb of God who takes away sin. Now, it can be difficult for our our Western ears to understand and fully appreciate John's announcement here, but if you were a first century Jew, this saying would have a whole avalanche of meaning tied to it. For them, a lamb wasn't just something you, you ate or something like a side dish at Christmas lunch. No, a lamb was something that was sacrificed in the temple for Passover. It was a symbol that would have reminded people of God's great rescue of of their ancestors thousands of years before out of Egypt. That when God's judgment was coming, that a lamb was sacrificed so that it would pass over God's people. God's judgment would pass over. The lamb died in their place. But you might say, was a lamb really a worthy sacrifice for a person, for a whole family? No, it wasn't. And so when John here says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is a massive statement. What he's saying here makes it clear that Jesus would be the one to deal once and for all with human sin. Right? That brokenness, that rejection of God, that failing to love and honour him with all of our hearts, minds, soul and strength as the ruler of the universe. Jesus, as the true Lamb, came to die in our place as a sacrifice. And so that's, at Christmas, why we celebrate. This is why we celebrate Jesus coming into the world. Because he has come to set us right with God and to do what no one else could do. Now in America, in 1830, a lady by the name of Sarah Hale wrote a famous poem. And I wonder if you know what that is. Uh, Her poem is, Mary had a little lamb. Right? It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with Christmas. But for us, at Christmas each year, we stop and remember that the Virgin Mary really did have a little lamb, as John tells us here. The Lamb of God. The man Jesus. He is at the center of this bigger story that we are falling into. And he's coming, he's coming into the world is, is a cause of joy for us. And the reason is because that he would then go on and later die for our sins in our place. Uh, He's also the one, John tells us in verse 33, pours out God's spirit on us. But there's only one person who has the right to do that, who has the right to forgive sins, the right to pour out God's spirit. That's God. In verse 23 here, John the Baptist says, get ready, the Lord is coming. And here he is. God is here. God the Son, the Lord of the universe who made us, is also making a way for us to have a right relationship with him again. The Lord is here. And this is why for Christians, Christmas is such a time of celebration. It's why at Christmas, it's why it's a time of hope and joy. It's why we celebrate and sing of the angels and the shepherds and the baby born in the stable. Because at Christmas each year, it's a reminder that God loves the world so much that he would enter into it himself in the person of Jesus. God became one of us to deal with our deepest need. Now John the Baptist says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of, not a few people, but the world. It's a message of hope, not just for for first century Jews. It's not just for white Anglos either. It's a message of hope for all people. That no matter where you're from, no matter what your language, no matter what your background is, no matter what your skin colour is, Jesus entered into the world and died so that all people are able then to come to him and find the assurance of forgiveness and new life. Christmas is a time of great joy because God offers us such a wonderful gift through Jesus. And like any gift, it's one that actually needs to be received on our part. We need to open our arms to what God has done for us. And so then let Christmas be a time that no matter who you are, where you remember God's immense love for you, that he would enter into this world and die for you and me, beginning in humility, being born as a baby,
finishing in humility, dying, being nailed to a cross. And so then let everything you do at Christmas be a celebration of God's love. And let what you do, like John the Baptist, be a big arrow, a big sign that points others to Jesus and say, this is why he is important. This is why he is my saviour. But if you're watching on and, and you're not quite yet sure how all this fits together or whether you want to even trust in Jesus, why he's good news, then let me encourage you to keep exploring the historical Jesus on the pages of scripture. Now, for us here at church, we're going to keep doing that throughout the new year into, into January. We're going to keep reading through John's biographical account of his Jesus life. And next Sunday, we're going to pick up right where we finished off here today. So if this Christmas has been a cause for you to stop and think about who Jesus is, or to wonder again about God's amazing love for you, then I want to encourage you that a great next step would be to keep coming along over the next few weeks, or when you come back from holidays, as we explore Jesus in the pages of John's Gospel. Because you have a God who knows you, who wants to have a real and deep relationship with you, and so we'd be silly not to, our, not to open our hearts to the love that God shows us at Christmas time the love that he's shown us through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have shown us yourself, that you entered into the world in the person Jesus. Father, help us to see your love at Christmas time. Help us to appreciate why Jesus is good news, that he is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Father, help us to dwell on that in our hearts and help us to point our friends and family to this Jesus as well. Father, may Jesus be on our lips, may he be on our hearts, and may in all that we do we be glorifying him in our lives. We pray this through his name. Amen. Well, we go now to another time of praise. See
Well, this is the time where I encourage you to pause the video and spend time in prayer. I'll be praying big things, be praying small things. And remember to be giving thanks this Christmas time for God's gift of love to us. Be praying that we live that out in our lives. Be praying that this Christmas time, others, including our friends and our family, would receive him for themselves. Uh, know the Lord Jesus. Go from death to life and experience true joy and peace. Let's pray. Well, as we conclude today, this is where I say to you, may Christ, the Son of God, gladden your hearts by his coming into the world to dwell among us and bring you peace. Friends, it's great to spend time looking at God's word. Happy Christmas. Have a great and blessed week.